Hi everyone, my name is Liz Hunter. I'm the Associate Director of Field Sales for Workman Publishing, and today I am here to introduce our authors so you can hear from them in their own words. The ABCs of Black History was written by Rio Cortez with illustrations by Lauren Semmer. The book is currently slated to come out December 22nd, although we are working to improve the pub date, so we'll have an earlier date soon. Um, here is Rio to tell you more about the ABCs of Black History. My name is Rio Cortez and I am a mother, a poet, and a bookseller. I wrote a picture book called The ABCs of Black History, which is out this December from Workman Books. Um, I wrote the ABCs of Black History to celebrate and honor the history and culture of Black people from its widely known figures to our more unsung movements and heroes. And it was important to me to consider the incredible spectrum of Blackness to be inclusive of women, LGBTQIA history makers, and some people who are making history today. Uh, when I was growing up, it, there were very few resources for me to learn about my history. And I was so inspired by what I did learn in the classroom and from my parents about people like Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and their work in the civil rights movement that I took it upon myself to learn more, and go to our elementary school library uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah. And as an adult, as I've continued to grow and learn about black history, I think about how valuable it might have been for me to have that knowing as a young child and for those seeds to be planted. Um, and this book has certainly grown closer to my heart um, as my family has been watching recent current events unfold, watching America come to reckon with its own history surrounding race. And we've been searching even more, I think, for some context about what has brought us here and a context that I can share with my young daughter. Um, I know a lot of families are having these conversations at home and my hope is that the ABCs of Black history can be a guiding light for young people, caregivers, and educators who are looking to plant these early seeds of knowing. Um, this book is told in rhyming format. It has tons of juicy back matter, expanding even more on the inspiring people, places, and events in this book. And it is beautifully illustrated by debut illustrator Lauren Semner. Um, I hope you have a chance to read the ABCs of Black History coming soon from Workman Books. The Mighty Silent E by Kimberly Gard is coming out August 18th from Familias with illustrations by Sandy Sonke. Little E has always wanted to be a hero, but at school, He's just too quiet to stand out. That is until one day when he doesn't show up to class. The other little letters don't even notice he's missing until they get busy trying to make words. Will little E finally get his chance to come to the rescue? My name is Kimberly Gard, and this is my book, The Mighty Silent E. And in it, I share a unique approach of teaching vowel sounds, spelling, and the power Mighty E has. This is the third book and the Language is Fun series by Familius, and I hope you will enjoy it. Skunk and Badger by Amy Timberlake is coming September 15th from Algonquin Young Readers. Written by Amy Timberlake with pictures by John Clausen. This book is so fun, so special, and here's Amy and John to tell you about it. I was thinking about Winnie the Pooh, and as I was thinking about Winnie the Pooh, I thought, well, what would it be like if I wrote a Winnie the Pooh, but not Winnie the Pooh, but Her. through me? Because mm -hmm. I, you know, what kind of story would I write if I wrote sort of an episodic yeah. um, story of two friends and talking animals? So, I have this thing that I hated talking animals for 
forever and I would never write a talking animal. <laughs> never, never. There will never be any talking animals by Amy Timberlake. And then of course, the truth is, is that more than anything, I wanted to write a talking animal. <laughs> like I think, sometimes I think the things right. that you, you're really yeah. saying, that you really say you'll never do, there, there's something deep there that you actually sort of want to. And, and for me, like skunk and badger are two parts of myself, very much parts of myself. So, right. you know, there's skunk who's playful and spontaneous and um, uh, external processor. <laughs> and then, and then badger is, he's, he's more interior and um, tr always trying to be focused on his work and never feels like he's successful at that. You know, I feel, I feel both of those things. Like I, I'd like to be, I'd like to live skunk's life all the time. Yet there's yeah. another part of me that's like, no, I have my important rock work. I'm going to focus, focus, focus. Right. Today, I'm finally going to reach that level of focus that I have been, I've been striving for. Yeah, no, I could, I definitely, I think that was maybe part of it too, was my relation to Badger, Badger's need for like almost darkness and quiet, where he just wanted his cave. Um, <laughs> and like, all, we just had, I think that by the time I got your text, we just had a baby. He was maybe, I'm not sure he was a year old yet. He was our first, we have two now. Um, but it was that, like, I was like, oh yeah, there's a guy. <laughs> all I wanted was my cave, you know, to go to work. I missed my work and I missed, you know, it's, it's, it's a shock to have a baby and to be like, oh man, like my time isn't my own anymore. Um, and this guy shows up at your door and you're like, oh, come on in, you're gonna wreck the place. And, <laughs> and that feeling of, like, that's why the cover is what it is too. It's like this nice homey sort of cover with just this one open blasting bit of sunshine and, and just this agent of chaos is about to come into the <laughs> um, Like that was, it was the first drawing I did, I think. Um, there wasn't even a bunch of different roughs. It was like, that's oh. the one. It's a, it's a dark sort of homey little place with this like square of light with him just kind of coming in. Um, it was, yeah, I was I very, I related to it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Fioria by Shamile Saeed Mendez is one of my favorite books that I've read this year. It is a YA novel and it comes out September 15th from Algonquin Young Readers. This is my YA debut and this story has lived in my mind and my heart for a long time. So when I started writing with the intent to be published one day, it was about 15 years ago and I took the first advice that I received at one of the very first writer's workshops that I attended to write what was in my heart and, and to write what I knew. And although I have lived in the United States for 23 years, in my heart, I always uh, kept my city or I always stayed in my city with my heart. I'm from Rosario, Argentina. Rosario is four hours north of Buenos Aires. And a lot of people are very familiar with Buenos Aires, with um, the wonderful authors, but not a lot of people know a lot about Rosario, uh, which is a very diverse city. Uh, it's a, an industrial city, so not a lot of tourism, and maybe that's not why a lot of people know about it. The reason Rosario is very well known all over the world is because we export soccer players, or how we call them, football players. Leo Messi was born in my father's a childhood neighborhood. My cousins all have pictures with him and even though every time I go to Argentina I try to, to accidentally meet him in the streets, I've never been lucky enough and I keep <laughs> hoping that I will and that I will meet his wife and we'll be best friends. And um, so but in Rosario we don't, we, uh, there's not a lot of women's football. Though here in the United States our women's national team they're multi-world champions, multi-Olympic champions. Soccer in South America, including Argentina, has uh, been relegated just for the men. And uh, I remember growing up and just loving the sport so much and being told that it was only for the boys, that girls should play something more ladylike, like field hockey or volleyball, which I love too, but I wanted to play soccer as a child. Um, and that strange combination of, of people that is obsessed with sports and also with books 
And so in Furia, I had the opportunity to mix my two loves. Furia is my love letter to, to the beautiful game and also to the authors that made me the person that I am today, not only as the writer or the reader, but the person, uh, because they influenced me with, with their stories and with their life journeys, writing uh, even when the dictatorship had banned their works uh, and being um, brave enough to tell their own truth even when the conditions were terrible. There's a big component uh, of romance because I have a very romantic heart. So I poured all of my favorite things into this story. And uh, Camila grew up as a character, as I grew up as a person. I, when I started thinking about, about her, I was a brand new college student here in the United States. Mm. And I kept developing her I, after I got married very young and my children were born. And then when I found Camila's real journey as a, a soccer player, um, I continued pursuing her story. And it's amazing to me and very surreal to think that it's almost her time to debut out into the world. <laughs> uh, Camila could be me in an alternate universe if I had chosen that path to be a footballera instead of a writer. Uh, I, I still play soccer. And <laughs> there's a lot of me in Camila, but my inspiration came from seeing the wonderful women that uh, around me, uh, from my mother who was an orphan from a very early age. And she had this drive to give my students and me a good education. And she was a fighter in every sense of the word. Uh, from seeing the, in, in my society, the mothers and grandmothers of Plaza de Mayo who would go out and, and uh, claim for the safe return of their children and grand, uh, grandchildren that had been disappeared by the dictatorship. And so I, I grew up seeing these strong women um, claiming and demanding for uh, human rights and equal rights. And even today in the New Una Menos movement, which the translation is kind of the opposite. It would translate like not even one more, which is the movement that originated uh, in Latin America and has spread all over the world and demands for the stop uh, of violence against women that's uh, endemic in sadly mm -hmm. in my country and other countries in, in, mm -hmm. in our continent and uh, seeing the marches, even from the distance, I'm just really inspired um, that these women continue to fight for the rights of everybody. And um, so those are my inspirations for Camila, a person that would not be told what to do. And in fact, whenever she was told not to do it, that was, that's inspiration enough for her to go ahead and do exactly that. <laughs> The Scapegracers by Hannah Abigail Clark is the first in a new YA series from Erewhon Books. It publishes September 15th, 2020. Here's Hannah to tell you about their debut novel. I'm Hannah, I use they them pronouns. I came of age in a rural Midwestern town, not all that unlike the one in this book. Um, prior to where I'm about to read, Sideways, our crusty lesbian protagonist, has, at the behest of the local mean girl clique, cast a spell on their Halloween party that resulted in mysterious chalk sigils materializing across the walls and, more troublingly, the bodies of three deer to appear in the bottom of their hollowed out swimming pool. Sideways blacked out after casting the spell and has no recollection of the rest of the party's events. Now, it's the following night. They've got three deer corpses to deal with, and the four of them are tentatively considering themselves friends. The Katie dids were dead by now, so the four of us sat in total silence out by the pool. We perched on the edge with our legs dangling into the depths, and the stillness was thick in the air. The flamingos balanced on their skinny plastic legs. My skinless knuckles stiffened in the cold. The only light fell from the deck behind us, and our shadows stretched like fingers over the pale deer below. We didn't speak, as though breaking the silence might wake the darkness and solidify it into something that could grab our ankles and yank us off the ledge. Daisy rocked her head back and stared at the night. There's trash bags in the kitchen. 
we could stash them inside, carry them up the stairs, and toss them in the back of your car, Jane. Leave them in the woods somewhere. I don't want them in my car, said Jane. I don't want them anywhere near anything that belongs to me. They'd be heavy, I said. I could lift them, but it wouldn't be clean. I imagined their stomachs bent around my neck, heaved fireman style over my shoulders with their hooves dangling near my hip bones. I wasn't sure what dead weight felt like. My insides felt hoarfrosted. I want to bury them, said Yates. She looked greenish out of the corner of my eye, the blood gone from her face. We can't just put them in trash bags and dump them somewhere. That feels wrong. Burying them is a lot harder than leaving them somewhere. They're just deer. It shouldn't matter, said Daisy. But it did matter. If Yates said it so, then it did. So it did. Sideways, said Jane. Her voice was hushed. Can I ask you something? Shoot. I ran my nails up and down my knees, tripped the rough edges over ingrown hairs, stung a little. Do you know how they died? The fawn's eyes reflected the porch light. For a second, it looked almost aware, like it was glancing back at me. There wasn't a single mark on any of them, and the flawlessness spoke of supernatural influence. They were so carefully spaced, so tenderly arrayed, so meticulously aligned with each other on the wall. This was ritualistic. These were magic killings. I looked at the fawn and forgot how to swallow. No, I said. But that wasn't what she was asking me. Let's just go inside, said Yates. We'll scrub the walls tonight and finish this tomorrow. I feel better about things that way. I don't know if I can sleep if we touch them again tonight. Jing slumped her shoulders and her hair fell on her face. Fine, she said. Let's go inside then. So we went inside. Yates and I carried wash rags and bleach water down the stairs to the basement, but we needn't have. Jing and Daisy were ghost-faced on the landing. All the chalk glyphs on the walls were gone. All right. The Nightland Express is a YA fantasy novel written by J.M. Lee. Erewhon Books is publishing this in March 2021. And here's Joe to tell you more about the book. Hello, I write as J.M. Lee. Um, ultimately, The Nightland Express is about two characters that have very intersexual identities. Um, and intersectional identities. And um, that was something that it drives a lot of the magic of the plot. Um, and as a person who is also of intersectional identities, I find that like growing up, because this is a YA book, when I was a young adult, I was looking for books that would tell me like how to be and how to do and like what do I do? And I've inherited this world and I don't know what to do with it and am I responsible for it? And a lot of questions that I really struggled with that probably motivated my writing and to become a writer. And so this is sort of the book of like, I don't have all the answers, but here's my thoughts so far. <laughs> and I think that um, like, if I could say like, what is this, what, what do I hope people will get out of it? I hope that young adults who were like me or are like me, um, at least find like like some action items or like some advice or some hope or some thoughts that they maybe hadn't thought of. I guess that's sort of the the overall impact that I'm go I'm going for here. The Rise of the Red Hand is coming out in January from Erewhon Books. This is a YA fantasy novel. Here's Olivia Chada to tell you more about it. Rise of the Red Hand takes place in about 100 years. Um, in the future in South Asia, uh, where the world has been reorganized um, because of a nuclear catastrophe, actually war. Um, and so the main character here that we're looking at is Ashiva, and she's a smuggler and a cyborg. For this book I, and the series I'm thinking about, or I had to imagine, obviously, the nuclear wars that could happen, but also just the, 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 the effects of climate change. So I did a lot of research on climate change in 100 years and the sea level and looked at maps and really thought about the air quality. I mean, it was really tedious and fun for me to think about that. Um, uh, all of the science uh, is there and you just have to kind of compile it. But I also looked at the history of India. I did my PhD on, well, part of my PhD on the partition of India. So I used that as kind of like the understanding of 
culture and community and what would happen in another rush of people were escaping the coastal areas to the inland areas. And I based it in a place near Pune today, um, although all the cities are different in, in this. So uh, I just really passionate about the environment. I think a lot of people are. We see it as a big, scary thing that a lot of people aren't taking seriously. Um, and also the conversation around climate change tends to be around white affluent narratives and uh, when climate change is a very real problem in a lot of the world right now, you know, we are, I'm in Colorado. There's, you know, we're, I'm, I'm in high altitude. <laughs> so it's, it's different when you're kind of tucked away and protected. And I really wanted to think about um, what's happening in places that are really vulnerable uh, about overpopulation, about places that are um, gonna already feeling the effects of these changes right now and dying from these things right now. And um, also these two characters in the book are from opposite, opposite sides of the tracks and um, they really kind of are having this discourse about their differences the whole time. Um, and then they kind of see from each other's perspective. And I really hope that, you know, the readers can see that um, because a lot of the discourse gets politicized and then it's ruined because it's not, it's not something to be discussed. It's something to just know. We should know. <laughs> we should take care of the planet. We should know we should take care of each other. Um, so I'm really hopeful. I'm really hopeful about the, the, the teens today. I feel like they're so much smarter than I was. Um, and they care so much more and they're way more um, just aware. And so I'm, I'm really hoping that they just catch on this conversation and maybe think more globally about climate change and also about their relationships with other people who are not like them. How to Astronaut by Terry Virts. It's coming out September 15th from Workman Publishing. And here's Terry to tell you all about it. Hi, former astronaut Terry Virts here. Ever wonder what it's like to be in space? I break everything down for you in my new book, How to Astronaut. And I mean everything. How to Astronaut is a book about space travel. I've written it so that you'll have two reactions, to laugh and say wow. It's a collection of 51 short stories about all aspects of flying in space. Some of my stories are to be expected, like, how to fly a T-38 supersonic jet, how to train for space shuttle emergencies, how NASA plans for space disasters, and learning to speak Russian. And some are unexpected, like how to film an IMAX movie in space, why you should never plan on wearing tidy whities in space. And I even address the ever popular question, has anyone ever had sex in space? And some are life-changing. Is there a God? Are there aliens? And how do space station astronauts time travel? This book is meant to be fun. You can pick it up in any chapter and read it in any order. After reading How to Astronaut, I can't promise that you'll be ready to be a rocket surgeon, but I am sure that you'll enjoy it and learn a few things along the way. Like, what do you do if you're stuck in space and your rocket engine won't light up to bring you back to Earth? Or how isolation in space is different than isolation in COVID down here on the planet. So enjoy How to Astronaut, no matter if you're at the beach, by the pool, or enjoying some work from home quarantine time. Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink by Jared Dieterle is coming out September 15th from Artisan Books. Here's Jared to tell you about his new book. As a hero. Mine are brewers and distillers, and not just because I like to have a good drink after work. My name is Jared Dieterle, and I'm the author of Give Me Liberty and Give Me a Drink, and I'm an alcohol policy expert and drinks writer, which means that I think I pretty much have the coolest job in America. I get to write and think about alcohol and get to enjoy a lot of good field research along the way. My book is all about the insane alcohol laws that keep us from having fun. Like in Boston, happy hour is illegal. In New Mexico, you can't have a $1 margarita. In Los Angeles won't even let you put beer too close to the cash register at gas stations. 
That's because we're still nursing a 100-year hangover uh, after Prohibition, and a lot of the outdated and most ridiculous laws that we have in our books today have to do with alcohol and how we drink it. In fact, in every one of the 50 states, there's a really, really dumb law that really hurts brewers and distillers and vendors, and also raises the price of our favorite cocktails. Now, a lot of the laws we have around alcohol are good things, so we don't want people to drunk drive or have alcohol abuse disorders, but do we really need to protect people from volunteering at wineries like California does, or banning booze sales on election day like Alaska? Probably not. So what can we do about it? I decided to write a book. I feature one law from each state, along with a couple extras thrown in, and I pair it with a cocktail recipe. Because if we're going to talk about how screwed up our system is around alcohol, we might as well have a drink or two along the way. I think we can all agree that it's been a pretty terrible few months out there. So I hope my book can bring you a little bit of fun and a lot of good drinking. Cheers. We Saw Scenery is a hilarious graphic memoir by Meryl Marco which Algonquin Books is publishing on October 13th. Hi, I'm Meryl Marco, the author of a new book, We Saw Scenery, which is not my first book, but is my first graphic novel. Something I really never thought I would do. It just looked like too much work, even though I went to count them six years of art school. This is video right here of me in art school smoking next to the acetylene torches, which was uh, forbidden, and my idea of a hilarious joke, dancing right there on the edge of death. Oh, the fun we had. Anyway, the idea for this book came from uh, a day where I was cleaning out this incredibly messy office that you see me in right now, and I came upon these little diaries that I kept in grade school. One of the really important features of these diaries was that they had a lock and a key so that only the only I could see what was in them. And I started thinking to myself, what was it I was writing in these things that was so important they had to be kept under lock and key? I'm not writing anything nearly that important these days. So I had this idea that I would sit down and read them. I started wondering, who was this person who had not really turned into me yet? Was she mainly my mother? Was she an imitation of my friends? What kind of advice would I have for her? Would I like her now? Would she remind me of me? What would I say to her if I had a chance to talk to her now? Would I have advice for her? Would she listen to me? Anyway, these are some of the ideas that I explored in this book, uh, in which I found a lost world of the 60s as seen through the eyes of an adolescent girl. A world that was, oddly enough, more familiar than not. You know, we didn't have the phrase climate change, but we had the hole in the ozone layer. We didn't have Burning Man, but I went to the Ken Kesey acid test as you can see, now I've done a wardrobe change in order to keep this video exciting. Anyway, uh, the, as the book progresses, it ends up being sort of a meditation on memories. Which things do you retain? Which things do you forget? Um, and the uses of humor and creativity as a way to get through adolescence, which is basically what I feel like saved my life. So uh, I hope you like the book. and. Um, and for more wardrobe changes, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to have to go out and buy some more clothes. Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day, and I hope I do too. Okay, one more wardrobe change. Jess Phoenix is a volcanologist and the author of Misadventure coming March 2021 from Timber Press. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut, a superhero, the president, an NFL player, and a veterinarian. Now that I'm an adult, I get to unlock the secrets of the universe, sometimes chase down narco traffickers, and 
I get to work on actively erupting volcanoes. My name is Jess Phoenix, and my new book, Ms. Adventure, My Wild Explorations in Science, Lava, and Life, is coming out in March 2021 from Timber Press. Now, this book fills a huge hole in modern literature. We just don't have accounts of women doing scientific field exploration in remote and dangerous places all around the planet. It's just not there. And even now in 2020, I get TV executives who say that they can't have a show with a female host like me because no one would believe that I'm a scientist because I'm too young and too female. So I got news for them. Well, actually, tons of people all over the world, just like me, are doing really amazing scientific research. Now back to the narco traffickers. Uh, I was actually doing research on ancient volcanoes in Sinaloa, Mexico, and some narcos stole my rock hammer, this. Now this is my number one tool as a field scientist, and I use it to pry the secrets of the universe out of rocks. When the narcos took this hammer, I actually had to chase them down off of a mountain and then beg in my very best Spanish for them to give it back to me after I had convinced them that no, there wasn't any gold nearby and yes, volcanoes are dangerous and I could help them if they gave me the hammer. That story and tons of other nail-biting and beautiful, wondrous tales are in my book, Ms. Adventure, which is coming out very soon. So thank you so much and I hope you give it a read. How to Argue with the Racist by Adam Rutherford came out earlier in August from the Experiment Publishing. Hello, my name is Adam Rutherford and I am a geneticist and writer and I'm the author of my latest book, How to Argue with a Racist. Now, I felt compelled to write this book because conversations about race, about racism, about scientific racism seem to be becoming more and more present in our public lives. Little did I know that race would come to dominate the two biggest global events of recent years, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has become racialized due to the fact that black, Asian, Hispanic, Latino people seem to be more susceptible to infection and indeed death for reasons that we don't fully understand. And then of course there was the killing of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Now, this is a book which is aimed to equip you to deal with conversations that we are all inevitably having more and more uh, with friends or with family or on social media, with people who are actual racists, or people who might be well-intentioned but are effectively expressing racist views. So these are questions about intelligence or about ancestral purity or about sport. So for example, there hasn't been a white man in the final of the 100 meters sprint in the Olympic final since 1980. That was also the last time that any of the competitors, the winners, won with a time of over 10 seconds. Now this might lead you to think that people descended from the enslaved from West Africa are predisposed to being good at sprinting, to being good at sport in general, and this is a very commonly held belief. Unfortunately, it is not what the science says. And in this book, I explain why, and why these stereotypes, such as East Africans are better at long distance running, or Jews are good with money, or East Asian students are better at math, why these stereotypes are both wrong and why they are damaging. So these are questions that are being asked more and more, uh, as we have conversations about race because they have become normalized due to our changing politics. Anyway, it's all in here. These are the arguments you need. This book is a weapon. It is a tool for dealing with conversations about race, especially when science is being used to justify bigotry. Because even though during history, science has been used to justify racism, today it is no ally to racists. And that is why you need to get tooled up. How to Argue with a Racist is available to order right now. Wake Up Grateful by Christy Nelson is coming out November 24th from Story Publishing. Here's Christy to tell you about it. Hi, my name is Christy Nelson and I'm the author of Wake Up Grateful the transformative practice of taking nothing for granted. It's a big book, it's a big promise. It's the promise that life is a gift and this book helps us to remember. 
I wrote this book because at 33 years old, I survived stage four cancer and that woke me up and helped me realize how precious life is, how short and fleeting it is, and to really take nothing and no moment and no thing and no person for granted. It's a powerful lesson. And the lesson of gratitude is that the more grateful we are, the happier we are. Brother David Steindl-Rast, who founded a network for grateful living, said, it's not happiness that makes us grateful. It's gratefulness that makes us happy. And so I learned this in my life experience with cancer. And I wrote this book to help people learn how to practice being present, having perspective, and seeing possibility. Those are the pathways to living a grateful life. Gratitude can be so fleeting. The rose dies on the vine, the sun goes behind a cloud, but we can be grateful in every moment, even when we can't be grateful for everything. Even in difficulties, we can find the path to being grateful by cultivating perspective. It's a practice. So this book was written as a way to give people who read this book the tools, um, all of the, the guidelines, the philosophy. It's a part memoir of my life and my experience with cancer to really show that this practice has teeth, that we can really live this way. And it's um, got journal prompts and practices throughout the book that you can use on a daily basis because we all need to remember how much life is a gift, not to look that in the face and forget, but to remember every single day that this is our precious opportunity to be alive. You can transform your life through being grateful and this book will help you transform not just your life, but the world. Here it is. Wall Disease by Jessica Wapner is coming March 2nd, 2021 from the Experiment Books. Here is Jessica to tell you more about her work. Alani Katoon was 15 years old when she was shot in the chest while trying to climb the fence separating Bangladesh from India. She was on her way to be married. Instead, she died begging for water straddled between two countries. More than 75 border walls now line the globe. Some are made of concrete. Some are tangled knots of barbed wire and concertina wire. Some are built to keep out drugs and weapons. Others are made to keep out immigrants seeking refuge from violence and depredation in their home countries. There is little evidence that any border wall in the world accomplishes its stated goal. There is a mounting evidence that they harm the mental health of those living within their shadows. Wall disease was first diagnosed in East Germany. A psychologist at the time noticed strange issues arising among his patients and realized that the Berlin Wall itself was triggering them. I wondered if border walls today were causing similar problems. It turns out that a growing body of evidence is showing just that. In Northern Ireland, people living near the peace lines, the separation barriers built during the troubles, have higher rates of depression and anxiety than people living further away. In Germany, people estimate distances to places that used to be on the opposite side of the Berlin Wall as further away than they actually are. They've internalized the wall into their own minds. All around the world, border walls are associated with stress, fear, depression, anxiety, as well as poverty and lower levels of educational attainment. These all have lasting consequences on physical and psychological health. Wall disease is based on extensive interviews with neuroscientists, geographers, sociologists, psychologists, other professionals, as well as people living near the border between the US and Mexico. All of this reporting points to one fact, the mental health consequences of border walls need to be taken into account. Where people experience fear and oppression from a border wall nearby, that's wall disease. Where people are concerned about the other living on the opposite side of the wall, that's wall disease. Where people feel hope and despair at the sight of a wall, that's wall disease. We all have a little bit of wall disease in us. Stories like the one of Falani Katun worsen the wall disease that those who hear it already suffer from. There are many more stories that need to be told. 
wall disease brings these issues into the cold light of day so we can begin to include them in future conversations about border walls. The evidence is too persuasive to ignore. Baking at the 20th Century Cafe is shaping up to be one of Artisan's biggest books this fall. It's coming out October 13th, and here is author Michelle Polzine talking about the book. So I picked the, I didn't necessarily pick the recipes that I thought would be the easiest for the home cook. That's kind of not really what this book is about, but it's about, um, the recipes in this book are very like, most of them are made by hand. So you don't need like a lot of ridiculous fancy equipment to make it work. Like I'm saying, like you can have a super fancy rolling pin or you can have a wine bottle. It's fine. It's like, you can have a fancy like Cuisinart or you can like just chop it a whole bunch um, with a knife. Um, you know, I don't have like, we don't like do laminated doughs on a giant sheeter. Um, have, I thought I chose the recipes that I thought represented like the work that was the best here and all the things that I thought people would really, really like to do at home. Um, I didn't pick anything that like had super fussy, like specific regional ingredients that no one would be able to ever find. Um, and that was kind of what I used to cut out. But yeah, I picked things that would be really good and like really challenging and fun and would make you feel you know, good about yourself when you made something, even if maybe it did take your whole day, sorry. Afterlife by Julia Alvarez came out earlier this year in April, but you can really never hear too much from Julia, Julia Alvarez. So here she is talking about Afterlife. Reading has always been about being together apart. One of my first favorite books as a kid was The Arabian Nights, Shahrazad, who keeps herself alive by telling stories. And to me, that's always been a very resonant story. Stories help us survive the worst of times and give us strength for the labyrinth. It's, it's not gonna provide answers. Books don't do that. The best stories don't do that. But they help us understand the questions and they help us feel accompanied. My hope is that afterlife will make those people going through fear, loss, uncertainty, will make them feel a company. If it can do that for some readers, I, I will feel very, very grateful.